Hello and welcome to this year's LGBTQ plus History Month book chat for kids and teens. I'm Liz Chapman from Sheffield Libraries and I'm delighted to be joined once again by Zoe Dixon from Lambeth Libraries. Welcome Zoe. Hi, thank you and lovely to do this chat once again. So exciting to talk about books and queer yes, books especially. And we, we have got loads of queer books here for you today. Uh, in fact, we have got so many that I don't think we will be able to fit everything in this book chat. Um, but we will, as usual, be posting a full annotated book list of everything we've talked about, plus the bonus ones over on the Sheffield Libraries blog, which is sheflibraries.blogspot.com. Um, before we start our book chat today, um, I just want to say that this particular edition of the book chat is in memory of a friend and fellow librarian of ours, um, Emerson Milford Dixon, sadly passed away earlier this year, um, unexpectedly. Um, he was a great force in the children's library world um, and a great believer making sure that the correct books were put into children's hands, especially LGBT books. Um, Liz, do you want to say anything more? Yes, that, well, I just want to echo that really. Um, he was absolutely dedicated to ensuring that LGBTQ plus books got to kids who need them. And also um, books featuring other marginalized identities as well. Um, he was an absolute powerhouse. Um, in in children's librarianship and we miss him very much um but he did a lot of great work while he was here um and i know that providing queer books to kids is something he would very much want to be remembered for absolutely anyway with those words shall we kick off with our picture books um this. yes so um my first picked book is The Woodcutter and the Snow Prince. Um, so this is by Ian Eagleton, um, who is the author of Nen and the Lonely Fisherman, which just recently won the first ever Polari Children's and Young, Young Adult Book Prize, um, which is the, the only book prize in the UK which is dedicated to queer books for children and young people. Um, so this one is by the same author, it's also, and it's illustrated by Davide Ortu. Uh, so it's a fairy tale, it's very much in the tradition of Grimm and all the traditional tales, and it tells the story of Kai, a lonely woodcutter, um, and he is remembering a magical tale that his grandmother used to tell him um, about a cursed snow prince who's trapped in a magical ice castle, except for on Christmas Eve when he breaks free and rampages through the woods, turning people to ice. So as the winter wind begins to howl and moan on Christmas Eve, Kai fears that the story will turn out to be true. Um, and it does. But with one key difference, um, the prince doesn't turn Kai to ice, but instead they go on a magical adventure together. And the next day when Kai wakes up, the prince and his ice castle have vanished. Could it all have been a dream? But Kai decides no, he is not going to just sit back and take this. He's not going to give up. He is going to fight for his prince. And he travels for an entire year. Um, so we see him going through all the different seasons. Um, and he arrives at the prince's castle uh, just as it turns to Christmas Eve again. He reaches out and strokes the prince's cheek and breaks the spell. So it's a lovely story. It's about the power of love. It's also about overcoming loneliness, which I think a lot of people have experienced a lot of during the COVID period. Um, the colour palette is in these beautiful sort of icy greens and blues and lilacs until at the end when the spell is broken and warmth and light flood back into the world. Um, 
So that's just, it's a really lovely fairy tale in a traditional mold, but with, with two men as the, the protagonists. Um, it's published by Owlet Press, who are the same publishers as Nen and the Lonely Fisherman. And I was excited to see that they've actually got a same-sex female version of Cinderella coming out. Oh, really? Um, Yes, so it's coming out in June, so I'm sure we'll be revisiting that for our Pride book chat. I kind of really like that the story feels a perfect book to read during winter and Christmas, because we don't really have that much diverse store of Christmas stories, um, which is a little shame. Um, That's really true, actually, yeah. yes, yeah. So um, it's nice that we're starting to see a few more um, diverse in terms of sexuality and ethnicity Christmas books because lots of people celebrate Christmas and it's a yes. lovely perfect yeah. time and we should all be celebrated as we know well that's why we're talking about these books um so my books I don't really have any traditional narrative picture books but they're more non-fiction that I have to show you today um but they're aimed at very young children so I think it fits really well in with our picture book segment of the session definitely um so the first one I have is ABC Pride and um, this is, um, <coughs> sorry, it's written by Dr. Ellie Barnes and Louis Stoll and illustrated by Amy Feltz. Uh, it's a beautiful, bright, bold book. Um, basically the ABC of, it's um, given you definitions of A to Z of different pride concepts. Um, it wasn't what I expected um, because I assumed that it would explain some of the more well-known terms that we know when it comes to LGBT plus community and pride. So I assume that L would be for lesbians and B would be for bi, but actually it's not using those um, definitions. It uses um, loving and belonging. It's all about acceptance, which I think um, is a really nice and different way to teach your children about things connected to do with the LGBT community, which isn't about, um, because as well, those words can be quite hard to remember, quite hard to connect with. And I think a lot of these things are relevant to acceptance for lots of other different kinds of people, which I think is really important that um, we're aware of because you can be proud of any community that you're part of, whether you're part of the disabled community, whether you're black or East Asian or South Asian, you have to be proud and you can be proud and I think a lot of these terms apply to pride within those communities as well. Um, I, I read the same one and I really liked that like you say the the text was quite um, generally relevant but the the pictures the illustrations were clearly LGBTQ plus inclusive. Yeah so look at this one here you know this is C is for celebrate and it is to the women being married as a celebration um, but celebrate, celebrate anything. And I just really love the bold illustrations. It's really bright. It's really clear. It's really inclusive. You know, the, the um, illustrations and the people have, you know, different disabilities, different skin, different body shapes. Um, I love the flyers. You can see the, all the different flags, which represents the different identities within the community and everything. Um, I just think it's, it's really simple and it's really clear and it's a really good um, discussion point at the back for any parents um, who maybe are unsure of how to start conversations or any teachers who might want to carry on the conversation that this book starts and everything. And I just, I really like the diversity and I really like the boldness and the brightness of the book. And I just think it's a really lovely kind of simple way to introduce these concepts to young um, children. And I really like the fact that it also has a sort of visibly non-binary presenting person front mm. and centre. I mean, of course, there's not just one way to look non-binary, but the person, if you look closely, has long hair, but also stubble and is wearing a sundress and they have yeah. a child. And it's just amazing to see that because I think 
most people who move in queer communities will probably know someone who looks a bit like this or perhaps look like this themselves and many of those people do have children and it's amazing to see those families represented I think that's yeah. so important and you've got you know things like um someone has an hearing aid over here we've got someone who's wearing a hijab and you know these are all combating stereotypes about who we think are queer people and who are part of those communities it's really nice that they're represented here you know and I think all the authors and the illustrator are queer as well um, yes. the the illustrator is non-binary and also I went on their insta and found that they also draw our flag means death fan art fan art <laughs> so obviously they are an excellent person all round <laughs> If no one knows, Liz is very obsessed with um, <laughs> gay pirates. <laughs> if you're new to these channels. <laughs> so our flag means death. Very good pirate I show. I think I've managed to mention queer pirates in every single book chat so far. Yeah. By hook or by crook, somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Running theme, obviously. <laughs> so what do we have for us next? So my next book is by an author who will probably need no introduction to anyone who um anyone who knows about lgbtq young people's literature um so juno dawson who of course is mainly known for writing ya um but this is her first picture book and it turns out pleasingly um that um she is just as good at writing picture books as she is at writing YA and this one is called You Need to Chill. Um, so it's illustrated by Laura Hughes and published by Farshaw. Uh, it's told from the perspective of a small child whose gender is never specified or made clear in the illustrations but they are constantly being asked by their classmates what has happened to their older brother Bill. And the suggestions start off quite sensible, like, is he hiding? Is he ill? And then they rapidly get very wild and speculative. Was he eaten by a whale or shark? Was he munched up just like krill? And every response is greeted by the young protagonist with, hun, you need to chill, until... They finally lose patience with the ridiculous suggestions, all of which ha have the rhyme to rhyme with Bill. Um, so krill, chill, ill. Um, and But finally, they reveal at the end that actually their brother Bill is now their sister Lily. And it has this really, I really like the, the way it's, sort of almost explained but in a very accessible non-didactic way so it was maybe quite a shock at first but she's really just the same she looks a little different and she has a new first name she's still clever and funny and kind and cool she's really rather brill and if people have a problem we shout "Hun, you need to chill <laughs> and here we can see that the whole class has rallied round and is supporting them, which is just amazing. Um, and I like this because it's not a didactic book. It's got all these wild, kid-friendly, funny, humorous scenarios um, that children will find really entertaining. Um, it reminded me a little bit of Who's Your Real Mum, which we talked about in a previous book chat, um, in which the child makes up lots of fantastic mm -hmm. stories about what her real mum does um, before explaining that, of course, they're both the real one. Um, and the rhyme scheme works really well. It has great rhythm and scansion, which is always good because there are far too many picture books out there where the rhyme scheme is a little bit forced. Um, and yes, it would it would also work well for as a slightly more explanatory book for a child whose sibling was transitioning or even for using with the whole class. Um, so f really fun, but also useful. And it's also got awesome glittery sunglasses on the front. I mean, that's just 
just gonna make kids want to figure it out straight away <laughs> yeah <laughs> slap some glitter or something it's definitely gonna be picked yeah. up yeah can't go wrong no exactly and it sounds like a really good book and who doesn't love Juno Dawson <laughs> I know she's wonderful um so for my next book as I mentioned these aren't a narrative book this is called um, The Pronoun Book, written by Chris Ayala Kronos and illustrated by Melita Torado. Um, and it's just about the kind of pronouns that people use. Um, it's very simple and it's a very nice introduction to the different pronouns that people may have. Probably some grown-ups will find it useful too, because for some people they find it a bit of a challenge that sometimes people don't use the pronouns that we assume that they're going to use. So, how do you know what someone wants to be called? Well, how do you know? It's very, very simple. You just ask. And each page is kind of double spread. And it just says the most common pronouns that people use, she, her, they, them, he, him. And each spread is beautifully illustrated. And what I really like is the diversity of the people who use the pronouns. So as you can see here with she, you have people who, not just ethnically diverse, but also age, which is really important because it's showing mm. that there are older queer people and a lot of people who are prejudiced will say these are all new things that have just come around in the last few years. It's only young people. No, actually you will find many older LGBTQ people. Um, We've always uh, been here. Always been here. They may be just discovering the words to describe how they feel about their gender and, and discovering words to use instead of what they've always used, but they've always been here. They've always been around. And it's really nice that we've got this book, which shows older people as well. And mm. it also shows the diversity in people. And you can't, why you can't assume what someone's pronouns are because people are so diverse in what they look like in the pronouns that they use so they could be femme presenting they could be more masculine presented they could be in between it doesn't really matter and um, I think it's a really lovely book to show that as you can see and obviously it's got disability representation um, you know it's got body diversity it's got religious diversity and I think it's just a really really important inclusive book as well as the lovely colours and I like the fact that they don't use traditional colours for mm. things like hair and you know, they've got, in terms of people of colour and black people, they have different skin tones and not all one tone. There's darker skinned people. You know, it's just, it's like really nice to just show just how colourful people can be and the diversity within those people. And you know, look, the bread is pink here. <laughs> I just, it, I just love the, the touches like that. The, the trans pride colours, isn't it? Yeah. So I think it's really, really, really nice. Um, that it's using it and and you know it's got lights of indigenous people how often do you see indigenous representation in children's books you know you just don't see it that often and at the end of the book um we've got a lovely table here which shows some of the variety of pronouns that people use and there are so many that some i didn't even know so i learned from reading this book and it's got the pronunciations as well. So I really oh, that's really that. handy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I, I, I really, really um, think it's just a really simple book to introduce pronouns and the types of people that use different pronouns with a nice celebratory double spread mm -hmm. at the end. So I have got just one middle grade book today. And sadly, I don't have a physical copy of it because I got it as an advanced review copy on NetGalley. Um, but it is Jamie by L.D. Lipinski. Um, and they are, of course, the author of the fabulous Strange Worlds Travel Agency series, which we have talked about before and recommended in previous book chats. And I believe, in fact, that they have got a new Strange Worlds um, book out as one of the Free World Book Day books. Yes, correct. So yes. that's, <laughs> that is very exciting. Um, so this one is out at the end of March, so it will not be in your local library yet, but not too long to wait. Uh, so you may even be able to get on the waiting list for it already. And it's published by Hachette. 
Um, so this one is a little bit different from their previous books because it's a contemporary sort of realistic novel rather than a fantasy novel um, about Jamie, who is a happy non-binary kid and their life has run pretty smoothly until now. They've mainly just sort of flown under the radar. Um, but then they go into year six and they have to start thinking about what secondary school they want to go to. And in their town, there are only two secondary schools, one for boys and one for girls. Um, so nobody knows where Jamie fits. They're told they have to pick one, which will involve pretending to be something they're not. Um, but also, whichever way they choose, it will involve being split up from one of their friends. Um, so Daisy, who's female and will thus be going to the girls' school, and Ash, who's male, so will go to the boys' school. And for the first time in their life, they decide that actually they need to stand up and make a fuss about something. Um, so together with Daisy and Ash, they decide that they will ask the town hall to fly the non-binary flag. And when their request is rudely refused, they decide to take matters into their own hands. Um, as one character says, someone's got to change the world and it might as well be you, which <laughs> is a wonderful line. Um, so it's it, it after that, I won't I won't say what happens at the end. Um, everything escalates a bit, but it is ultimately a very feel good book. It is great for non-binary kids to see themselves represented um, in an authentic depiction from an author who is themselves non-binary. Um, I think it would also be quite eye-opening for kids who don't know any non-binary people or maybe think they don't know any non-binary people. Um, so it does definitely have elements in it that are educational. So the chapters are interspersed with uh, Jamie's guide, guide to Words, which explains some of the terminology that some readers might not be familiar with. But again, it's not just a didactic book. It's gently humorous. Um, you get really caught up in their cause. And it's got very good characters as well. I particularly liked Ollie's older, uh, um, Jamie's older brother, Ollie. Um, he's a great character. And although it doesn't shy away from problems, it's, it's really life affirming. Um, and one detail I particularly liked um, is that we are never told Jamie's gender as assigned at birth um, because it's just not relevant as the reader it's not our business they are a non-binary kid and that is that um I so really that, like that element of yeah, storytelling yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a lovely book and it also kind of makes it clear how Jamie is not the only one who this is a problem for um it's also a problem for the kids who are cisgender but Daisy and Ash, for example, will be split up and have to go to different schools because of their genders. There's some things that are not quite equal about the schools, like one has a swimming pool and one doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. So it's made very clear that this isn't just a, an issue affecting trans people. Um, I think it would be a really good read for anyone who enjoyed Benjamin's Dean, Benjamin Dean's middle grade books, Me, My Dad and the End of the Rainbow and The Secret Sunshine Project, which we've discussed in previous book chats. But it is it's a it deals with an important real world issue, but in a very accessible and engaging way. So that's a big thumbs up from me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sounds great. Um, you know, my book also is um, written by a UK author, Ian Eagleton again. Yay! Yay. It's written a middle grade book, um, Glitter Boy. I read it as an ebook, so I don't think you can actually see the cover. I'm not sure. It's probably I too bright. No, I don't know. No, sadly. Show can't up. See the cover. But it's a very fun cover because it's called Glitter Boy. So obviously, there are little bits of glittery paper. And I'll put, I'll put an image of the cover in the blog post so everyone can enjoy it. And um, so James is an 11 year old boy, a big Mariah Carey fan. He's just entered year six and is hopeful for year six. He's got a new teacher uh, who um, is a lot better than his year five teacher, was a bit mean. And so he's very hopeful for the, the year 
but he has some challenges. His grandmother is unwell and very frail and he visits her every day and he's keeping that the fact that she falls over and it's been a bit weak from his dad. His mother has left um, to go traveling with work and his dad is a bit angry and his relationship was fraught and he's also been bullied at school. Um, and this is, it deals with really serious issues because as you can tell from having a sick grandmother, having a mother who's left a dad where you're not quite getting on and seeing eye to eye and being bullied at school, his new teacher is gay. His new teacher is getting married to a man who is bi. And poor James is being bullied because people perceive him to be gay. He's being called a gay boy. He's got a girly voice. It is affects him that he's getting angry he's slashing out with his friends some of his friends aren't talking and how it affects him it's really sad how it dulls his light and um i don't want to tell you all the story of how things are resolved and how they go but what's really also sad is that there's no space safe space for him and this is reality of children today the friends set up a whatsapp group where they bully him why what's happened basically say if anyone talks to him they're also gay so people start to sort of stop talking to him his dad is sadly quite homophobic he's he doesn't want another friend of him joel who, who believes to be gay to spend time with him at his house because he thinks it's a bad influence he also doesn't want james to sing at his teacher's wedding because he's in the choir and he's been invited because it's not appropriate. He's too young because a lot of unfortunately homophobic people believe that just being queer is adult thing as opposed to it's about people, the person you love or the gender you are. It's not, these aren't adult things. And I just feel like it's a really important story and run in a really accessible way for, um, probably um, upper primary school age children, I would say. Um, and, but it also, you know, it's fun in parts, but I imagine a lot of kids will find it very relatable because unfortunately a lot of kids are bullied. And in this day and age, 2023, it is something where you don't have the safe spaces anymore. Whereas maybe before you could leave the school playground and you'd have a weekend away where you didn't face that. He doesn't have that because unfortunately he's facing homophobia from home although not as overt as at school as well as on whatsapp and he's having a few friends turn away and at school so it feels really kind of as an adult reading it it's really eye-opening to see what young people these days mm. are facing but it's also very hopeful because there are many many other students in the book who are supportive of the teacher and stand up for him and call out the homophobia when they see it so it's not all doom and gloom, it is hopeful as well. So I don't want to make people go into a really, really horrible, depressing book. It's not, it's absolutely joyous in the end. I also learned a lot about Mariah Carey because he's also obsessed with Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know a few of her popular songs, you know, Heartbreak and everything, but he has an encyclopedia knowledge. <laughs> I'm going to assume Mr. Ian Eagleton is a Mariah Carey fan. <laughs> Oh, maybe he just did really good research. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it's a really, at, at the end, it's a realistic depiction of relationships that people have with their family and friends and how people become more accepting of others mm -hmm. and how they develop when they get to know people and get to, and, you know, how they say experience breaks down barriers and prejudice. And that's kind of one of those books I do keep reading. I'm really looking forward to that because I haven't managed to get hold of a copy yet. So I'm looking forward to that one. And I do think it is lovely how we are now starting to see queer community depicted a lot more in books. Um, and I think actually now I come to think about it, that's quite a theme of several of the ones that we're talking about this week. And mm. it, it is, it is, I think, a much more accurate reflection of how queer adults live our lives. Yeah. But sometimes it can be hard for younger people to find that community. Mm. Um, 
yeah, but I mean, don't just... worry if you're a young person watching this your people are out there yes I mean I really like the different characters there are the, you know there is a non-binary librarian because he goes to the librarian and you know the nan's neighbors they are uh two uh, I'm assuming lesbian but they're sorry they're two women who are together they're a couple you know and there are other characters through because there are LGBTQ people in your life who you might not necessarily know, but you will have interacted with them. And it's really nice that explicitly said in this book and just having everyday life and just getting on and just walking their dog or helping you find that book at work. Um, I do have another middle grade book as well, because I know that Liz, you don't. Um, I don't this, this week, I'm afraid. Yeah, this one is from a US author called Small Town Pride by Phil um, Stamper. This is Phil's um, first middle grade book because he wrote The Gravity of Us, um, which was quite well known last year in this country um, as well. And it's about a young boy called Jake who um, he's come, it starts off with him having come out to his um, parents who are accepting. Um, they live in a small town, although it's not actually a town because in their state, a town has to have 5,000 people and they have 2,000, so technically it's a village. <laughs> but so in this village, um, he happens to have a flagpole on his front garden and to show his acceptance, his dad puts the progressive flag on the flagpole for the whole town to see. <laughs> And this starts off a chain of events where he decides that if the town is truly accepting, like it says on their strap line of the town, that they should have a pride parade in their town. And so with the help of his best friend and his very accepting parents, he starts off trying to get enough support to be able to hold this pride parade because he's not feeling very proud. He doesn't know how to be proud. He's come out to his family. He's come out to some friends, people know, but he feels like he can't be proud of who he is in his town. He lives in a very small town. All the media he sees, all the books he reads is set in cities, big cities, or where people have escaped to big cities where they can be their authentic selves. There are very few stories set in small towns and villages where people are living their openly, their lives openly and being accepted because I think there is a lot of assumptions that small towns tend to be more closed-minded. Mm -hmm. and, and this book is trying to kind of, um, show that, no, not everyone in a small town is closed-minded. There's probably lots of people there, even in a town with only 2,000 people, there are queer people who maybe aren't comfortable to come out. And if you want to, if you want them to come out and show that you're an accepting town, then you have to do more than say things. You have to actually do, back up your words with actions. And so that is a story of, you know, how, do, do they do a pride parade? parade? I'm not going to tell you because you need to read the book, um, but you need to see kind I of I bet how. they do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's not such a, it's not such an easy road because unfortunately the mayor, um, Although the mayor themselves is not homophobic, they do not like discourse. They do not like people having, showing that they've got different views because they want to present themselves as a, a town which is tolerant and accepting and harmonious as opposed to letting people. So actually what they're doing is withhold, upholding prejudice because they're not letting, they're letting the people who are prejudiced lead the narrative so as not to rock the boat and I think you know these are teaching children's lessons on what it means to speak up when to speak up how to speak up why it's important to speak up in these instance and in any circumstances and it can be hard because it's you know these are 11 12 year olds speaking up against adults but they're doing what they think is right and what they believe in and there's also lots of adults on their side as well but I think that's it's an important message for adults as well as children Mm, no, absolutely. It, it it can be hard, but it just takes one person to do it. And then you'll find that it's easier when there's more of you that can do it. But it is hard, but hopefully, um, you know, it shows how many teenagers and young people in this book are willing to stand up for what they know is right and, you know, teach the adults in their lives the lessons that they should be able to 
learn from their children themselves. You know, the children of the future, as they say, as, as when he's inside. <laughs> that sounds brilliant. Mm. I, I'll, I would definitely like to get hold of a copy of that as well. Um, right, shall we move on to young adult? Absolutely. So my first young adult one is uh, Happy Head by Josh Silver. So this is published by Rock the Boat. Uh, it's just out. Um, so this, it says on the back, we're in an ep epidemic, an epidemic of unhappiness. Um, here is the good news. Happy Head has the answer. And I thought before I started reading it that this was going to be sort of an in-depth de exploration of mental health difficulties and a sort of interrogation of the idea that we should all be happy. And there was an element of that, but that wasn't the main focus, um, which for me was a bit of a relief because um, I do feel that those books are really important. Um, there are a lot of young adult authors who do that very well indeed, like Holly Bourne, for example, Sarah Barnard. Um, but for me right now, I needed something a bit more escapist, and this really delivered on this front. So this is a sort of proper dystopian young young adults, like from like like the hunger games era when there were there were a lot of good dystopian young adult novels around in that era um and then we haven't had quite as many recently but mm. this is sort of a return to the golden age of dystopian ya if you can have a dystopian golden age that's a bit <laughs> of an oxymoron um and importantly for today it has a gay male lead um so 17 year old seb is selected to take part in an experiment to tackle this epidemic of unhappiness. And the Happy Head Project is a two-week live-in camp in the middle of nowhere with no contact permitted with the outside world. And the young peoples are assigned to teams um, and given a series of challenges which are supposed to show their initiative, bravery, teamworking ability, etc. So it all starts off quite innocuous with the sort of meditation and group therapy and all the sort of normal stuff that you might expect. Um, but very quickly, it starts to seem that something more sinister is going on. And so Seb is finding that alarm bells are ringing. Um, but on the other hand, he's actually doing quite well at the programme. And he actually would really like to succeed at something for once and make his parents proud of him, which he kind of feels has never happened. Um, a further complicating factor is his teammate, Finn, who is devastatingly handsome in an emo sort of way, um, but he is labelled as troubled and is very hostile to the programme. So is Seb going to take Finn's side or is he going to do what everyone else seems to want him to do and conform to the programme? Um, so, yes, it's really good. It's a pacey escapist thriller Um it's it's got a gay male lead um and uh yes uh, another strong recommend for this one sounds good especially um i saw the strap line um better than the hunger games on the front <laughs> that's quite yes that's quite I, high I, praise. Don't, I don't know whether it is better than the hunger games <laughs> but <laughs> but it is very good and yeah. um and there is going to be a sequel, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether it will ultimately be a trilogy like the Hunger Games, but there is definitely going to be at least one more. Um, and also, it's definitely more gay than the Hunger Games, which is <laughs> so it's definitely um, better in that sense, at least. So moving away from dystopian fiction, although this maybe is a bit of a fantasy, although no, not so much of a fantasy, um, from one of our favourite authors, um, Benjamin Dean, comes his first YA novel, The King is Dead. I know, what a title, eh? <laughs> what could that be about? Um, it's 
I had so much fun reading this book, I'm not gonna lie. Um, is the um, is a throne ready for a black king? Is a throne ready for a black gay king? Oh, well, no, because in this book, they are trying to bring James down. James is also just 17, 18, you know, imagine having that responsibility thrust on your shoulders. Your father has just passed away and you are supposed to put duty before anything else. You can't even grieve properly without it being judged. And obviously um, there's a lot of um, familiarity was one of the things that are happening with maybe our own royal family and a certain um, person who is married into the royal family who is not a white person and some of the criticism they are getting which is not explicitly um, said to be racist but we all know it's because she is not white um, so it's kind of um, I think um, Benjamin kind of brings out more of that aspect into this story um, where the mother who's black marries into the royal family um, white king who's the previous princess died um, like a few days before she got married and she's seen as you know the um the English rose they all love and adored and she can never live up to to her and so this shadow this is overshadowed you know, the whole family's <laughs> life and everything um unfortunately you know it's it's a it's very pacey as well read um Someone has found out that James is gay and he starts finding envelopes around. And he it's about him trying to navigate being the king because he's now king. And how will he deal with being not only black but also gay in the public eye with a journalist who is out to get him, who is following him, who is setting them up, who is setting them up, why they're setting them up. Well, we know why they want to bring down him and his family they don't want a black royal family for sure um it's just a really fun novel <laughs> really i think that that sounds awesome yeah. and i absolutely loved both his middle grade books so it's brilliant to see him writing ya now yeah and yeah as i said it's just it kind of feels like i'm watching some trashy tv um full of scandals and stuff like that but in like a queer black book form and mm. I think people would really really enjoy it it's just a really as I said it's really fun it, it it's, sounds very much up my street yeah it's just really fast moving things happen very quickly you kind of you know James isn't always the easiest person to like but he's a 17 year old boy <laughs> he, he makes silly mistakes but he's 17 so just unfortunately he's also the king and he has way more responsibility <laughs> he's not allowed to make mistakes essentially and because he doesn't always think with his head um he thinks with his heart or a bit more than perhaps he should but give it a read I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun reading it I think <laughs> I will I think out of all the ones we've talked about so far that one might have just shot to the top of my yes. to be read pile it was really weird as well because it actually was published before the queen died <laughs> but a lot of stuff what happens and you're like oh yes we remember you know the the two weeks of mourning and the and all you know the pageantry or mm, you know, what mm. that surrounds it all you know that's all reflected in in the book as well so it feels quite interesting <laughs> mm. Uh, so my next young adult one is The Sunbearer Trials by Aidan Thomas. So this was published last September by Macmillan. Um, he's the author of Cemetery Boys, which was widely acclaimed. And we discussed that in a previous book chat. I think you read it, Zoe. Um, I, I don't remember discussing it, but I've definitely read The Cemetery Boys, um, which is amazing. But, you know, yeah. Yeah, it was it was really well received. Um, and then he's also the author of Lost in the Neverwoods, which I think actually passed slightly under the radar. And I'm fairly sure that we missed out on that as well. Um, yeah, so I am definitely going to go back and get hold of that after reading this because this was so good. <laughs> um, 
like I literally kept waking up and reading this in the middle of the night when I was meant to be sleeping because <laughs> it, it was just gripping um so um actually in some ways this is also a little bit like the Hunger Games but um in in a different is a much more kind of fantasy inspired sort of way it, it is it's 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 less dark, although as we shall see shortly, it does deal with some difficult things. Um, so the Sunbearer trials are held every 10 years and 10 semi-dioses, who are the children of gods, are selected to compete. And the winner is crowned Sunbearer, but the loser must be sacrificed in a ritual to keep the treacherous obsidian gods at bay. Um, so our hero, Teo, he is not too worried. Um, he, rather than being a semi-diosis, he is, sorry, rather than being a gold semi-diosis, he is a jade semi-diosis. And they live in a two, um, two-tier society in which the golds are the elite. It is virtually always golds who compete in the trials and Jade's just sort of potter along in the background. So he's not too worried. Um, however, you can probably guess what is coming or else we wouldn't have a book. So to everyone's surprise, including his own, Teo is selected for the trials along with his friend Nia. Um, and uh, the Jades are at a disadvantage due to the lack of training, whereas the Golds have spent their entire lives sort of prepare preparing for this so he has a challenge on his hands to to ensure that he and his friends don't end up being sacrificed um so in its content and structure it is a little bit like um it's a little bit like the first hunger games book um it's a little bit reminiscent of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So if you want a Harry Potter alternative, which is much queerer, trans inclusive and written by a trans author, um, this is a perfect pick. Um, so Teo is trans and this is not the, the central theme of the book. Obviously the, the main theme is whether they're or not they're going to get sacrificed. Um, but it is sort of woven in naturally. So, for example, it's the first young adult book I've read where the main character does his tea shots. Um, and that is just mentioned very casually in the same way as it talks about him putting on his pyjamas. Um, so it's lovely to see that usualized. Um, there's also a number of non-binary characters and Nia is also queer. And there's a male love interest with whom Teo has a bit of an enemies to lovers arc. And I do, I love a good enemies to lovers arc. As do um, I. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's a Mexican inspired setting as well. Um, and that informs the myth mythology underlying the whole Sunbearer trials. Um it's so vividly described. I just, I, I really want this to be made into a film. It would make such a fantastic film. It's got the epic visuals. It's got the drama of the trials. It's got the love interest. It would be absolutely epic. So in the unlikely event that anyone from Hollywood is watching this, this is my top recommendation for your next big feature film hit. Oh, we are due a big teenage franchise aren't we because we really haven't had one they, they kept really trying are. yeah the hunger games with them um, what's it the veronica roth ones um divergent they, divergent yeah. but that yeah. was not as popular sadly um but oh, maybe, they are they are very good books i enjoyed yes. those yeah, the films were sadly not as good <laughs> sadly the books excellent the films they didn't quite capture I think the same spirit as like mm. the Hunger Games. That's a but, shame. Yeah, maybe one day we'll get our next big dystopian Nick franchise. Um, talking about things of TV and everything, I thought I will briefly mention the prequel to the um, They Both Die at the End, which has been turned into a TV show for those of you who don't know. So the prequel, The First to Die at the End by Adam Silvera came out last year. Um, 
I was a big fan of um, they first die, they, um, they both die at the end, no spoilers, because they, they do die, because it was such a beautifully written book. I literally cried buckets afterwards, so I was so excited to read the prequel. And it's um, um, a nice re-entry into the world. It's the first day of Death Cast. You meet two characters who fall in love, um, but you know, one of them is going to die at the end of the book. I'm not going to tell you which one it is. You do find out relatively earlier on in the book, but I don't want to spoil the book and you find him out um, who it is. And it's, you um, get chapters told from different points of view, including the creator of Death Cast. You never find out how Death Cast works, which is slightly frustrating as a curious person. I want to know, how, how do you know these people are going to die? <laughs> but the whole point is that you don't find out that's not what it's about. It's about living your life to the fullest and that really emphasised it again. And maybe there's a couple of chapters there where you meet Mateo and oh, I've forgotten the other name, um, um, when they're younger, um, which is kind of heartbreaking because you know they're both gonna die quite young <laughs> in the future. So it's a bit sad when you read them, you're like, oh. But if you didn't know this book was out, and I'm sure if you were a fan of they both die at the end that you would have known this was out, please do read it because it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a nice, um, to be back in that world, even though it's kind of scary to know when you will die, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> I think the the next one we've both read and we both loved this so much that we are both going to talk about yes. it. Um, <laughs> so Bitterthorn by Kat Dunn. Yes. Um, so we have previously talked about her series Fet of extremely queer series set in the French Revolution. Um, and the, the third one in that series is now also out, Glorious Poison, um, which I haven't quite had a chance to get to yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, but Bitthorn is out in May. So these are advanced proof copies. Um, but it's so lovely it's mm -hmm. it's a sort of dark very kind of quite luscious sinister gothic fairy tale um it's set in germany in the uh 19th century would you say zoe i think that it's really i'm really unsure of when it was set and i didn't want to dwell on it too much uh, really but yeah i think it's about the 19th century from the costumes and the mm. way the world is described yeah but it's got that kind of fairy tale quality of being sort mm. of outside time yeah. um and um and in the town where she where our heroine lives um she uh, so every 50 years, the local witch takes a sacrifice. Um, it has always historically been a young man. Um, nobody knows why um, this happens. Um, but as it is coming around to the time for the sacrifice again, um, everyone starts to get anxious, stops going out at night. Um, and then once she has taken the sacrifice, everyone can everyone can breathe easily again for a bit, except, of course, for the poor families who have lost a son or husband or fiancé. Um, anyway, um, in this particular instance, um, that the our heroine volunteers to be the sacrifice herself even though it is very rare for the witch to take a female sacrifice um so she ends up alone in the witch's castle not really knowing why she's there every day the witch goes off and does something mysterious so she's alone a lot of the time I think this is another of those books where you can tell it came out of Covid and an experience of loneliness that perhaps none of us had really experienced anything quite like that before um, but as time goes on despite her fears about what has happened to all these previous people um, and despite this very odd situation, she finds herself growing close to the witch. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I, I mean, can't I really, say anymore without yeah. spoilers. Um, exactly. You... <laughs> I mean, I, as I said, I love the book. I, I liked, um, I like how Mina grows as a character throughout the story. She is quite naive in certain ways, but also quite determined in other ways. I mean, the reason why, obviously, she kind of decides to volunteer herself, it, it feels a bit like she wanted to teach her father a lesson, in a way. Um, mm -hmm. So Mina doesn't really have a close relationship with her father, because it's a slight, it's the um, kind of Cinderella story a little bit, you know. Mm. It's a bit, a bit like Cinderella, a bit like Bluebeard. There's yes, also exactly. a, a magic spinning wheel. So there's yeah. elements and tropes from quite a lot of different fairy tales, but it weaves it together into something that really does feel very new and original. And it's always a kind of sense of foreboding when you're reading it. It feels very kind of, you can feel kind of um, the tension and it feels very oppressive. I think, you know, Cat Donna's Carice is a really great atmosphere that you're really sucked into when you're reading it. You absolutely and, are. Yeah. And you can just, um, it's it, the descriptions are very vivid of this German um, town and the forest that she has to get through and how the local village is close to the witch's castle. We don't know the witch's name, by the way. Not until the end, but so we're not going to spoil it for you. And how people are very suspicious and judgmental as well. Um, I do feel for Mina, and it, it, it is a happy ending, <laughs> obviously. Um, but I, I really, really enjoyed it. There's not enough kind of gothic queer romances mm -hmm. out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it reminded me of, um, oh, it's gone out of my head now. What is the uh, Dracula retelling um, by Kieran Millwood Hargrave, uh, which oh. is queer? Yeah, I've forgotten um, as well. Oh, it's gone out of my head as well. Oh, how annoying. <laughs> if you put Dracula retelling Kieran Millwood Hargrave into Google, you will find the book. Yes, um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I wasn't sure what to expect. And um, the cover, this is just the cover for the proof, but the actual cover for the final version of the book has been released and it's absolutely gorgeous as well, if you haven't seen it. The I haven't seen it, it yet. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Um, but the story as well, you're, you're not, you're, so, you're finding out what the witch is doing as Mina is finding out because you, you have no clue there aren't no. really any clues to what the witch is doing or why she's doing it and um, so it is a surprise to you as well you're just like the protagonist which I quite liked that element of yeah. taking the journey yeah, with I the character that. yeah I've just checked the title of the Kieran Millwood Hargrave novel and it is of course the Deathless Girls and that is wonderful as well and queer so if you read that and enjoyed it uh read this <laughs> if you haven't read that read both of them <laughs> um so we're coming towards the end of our chat but we still got a few more things to go i do have a graphic novel to talk about um it came out about three years ago so it's not that new, but it's something that I read recently and I really love and I wanted to tell you about it. It's Princess, Princess Ever After. And um, it's written and illustrated by Katie O'Neill, who illustrates quite gentle, nice stories. We have talked about the Tea Dragon Society graphic novels before in one of our book chats. It's the same writer as well. Um, so Princess, Princess Ever After begins um, with this princess is stuck in a tower and she's, um, asking for help and you know this princess comes along so she can help her she's like I don't want help I'm singing <laughs> but it sounded like it sounded like she needed help uh, but she is no Rapunzel in like in in the tower she doesn't really want help um but she seems very charmed by this princess who isn't a prince like the money that have come before and says that yes gives her consent that she can rescue her and from then, they, along with her um, lovely unicorn, who would do anything for a cookie, they go on adventures. Um, they meet a prince who is a bit upset that he has to be rescued by some princesses. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's a very, very funny story. I really laughed when I read it. Um, the princess 
I love this really one line I really like. She's like, I'll protect you, Sadie. I have a sword, a unicorn, and kickbot hair. And you know, <laughs> those are all awesome things. I would love a unicorn. I would love to have awesome hair. And I would love to have a sword as well. That is awesome. <laughs> and obviously they get closer together. But why was Sadie trapped in that tower? Well, it's not what you think. It was her sister who trapped her in that tower because her sister did not want to co-rule with her like her father requested on his deathbed. So even though the townspeople love Sadie the most, she trapped her in the tower. And what happens? Does um do they manage to get rid of Sadie's sister? And does she claim her rightful place on the throne? Do they have a happy ever after? I mean, it's princess, princess ever after. I, I think we can guess what's <laughs> going to happen between these two princesses. Um, and it's a beautiful speech book. I really, really loved it. Um, you know, Katie O'Neill just writes, they just write such lovely stories, which feel really heartwarming in a really accessible way for quite young readers as well in a graphic novel format. And just just some lovely characters and just, I like that Sadie is, an, uh, is um, a bit fatter than other characters. So I like the diversity in that way as well. She's a princess, but she's not a skinny princess like you would mm. typically see in yeah. stories. And it's just a really nice kind of fusion of different fantasy and fairy tale novels that we're all familiar with, but turning all those tropes on their heads about who needs rescue and who wants to be rescued. Mm. And yes. why we do the things we are because they have their reasons as well. I have two graphic novels. Um, put them on the floor because I actually have so many books at mm -hmm. the moment. Um, so this one is Thieves, um, published by No Brow Press, quite a small press. It's written and illustrated by French cartoonist Lucy Brion, and um, she translated it into English herself. Um, so uh, this is about Ella. Um, so she is, she, I think she falls into a, a bit of a trope in graphic novels of a queer female protagonist who is sort of a bit dorky but endearing. In this case, she's kind of characterised by her big ears. Um, so, um, and she is in her final year of high school. Her parents have relocated for work. Um, so she's living on her own in a little studio flat. She's not particularly interested in school and she just sit, sits at the back with her friend Leslie and tunes out, except for first period Thursdays when Madeline is in the class. And despite the fact that she knows nothing about Madeline, she has a huge crush on her. Um, she's in so deep, bless her. Just the sight of the back of Madeline's neck makes her go all funny. Um, <laughs> but one day, Ella and Leslie get a hot tip about a party that someone's having that they will be able to crash if they bring drinks. And they don't know whose party it is, but it's in a huge fancy house. Um, and Ella gets really drunk and throws up in a closet um, that's full of lots of fancy knickknacks, fancy clothes, jewellery, antique teapots and things. And then she gets home the next day, uh, wakes up the next day, discovers she has no memory of how she got home or anything that happened at the end of the party. Um, but she realises to her horror um, that she has stolen um, so some of this fancy stuff in her drunken state. Um, and things only become more complicated when she discovers that the party was Madeline's and all the stuff belongs to Madeline. Um, so the second chapter is from Madeline's point of view. And let's just say that things are not quite as they first appear. That's all I can say without more than giving away spoilers. But it's a love story. It's a madcap spree. And it's also a story about friendship and remembering to fancy, uh, to remembering to value your friends, even when you're in that first flush of love. Um, I didn't expect it to tug quite so hard on my heartstrings. This it. It really goes hard on the emotions, but in a good way. I, I really enjoyed this. 
That sounds really good. I, I've, I've seen that um, around, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. So well, I'm doing no, my it's, it's very good. And because it's a graphic novel, it's quite a quick read as well. Mm. Um, so uh, my second graphic novel is The Best of Assigned Male by Sophie LaBelle. Um, so some of you may have heard of Sophie LaBelle um, because this is based on her webcomic, which has been running since 2014. So she is quite a well-known and acclaimed cartoonist. So this collects the online content and there is some new exclusive content specific to this collection, which is published by Hachette. And it follows Steffi, who's a young trans girl, navigating the first years of secondary school and forming a group of queer friends. So they're about 11 at the start of the book and about 14 by the end. Um, and because of the format it was originally published in, it's mainly sort of short one page comic strips, um, although some form longer narrative arcs. But it means that um, either you can read the book start to finish like I did and it was brilliant, but also you would be able to just um, open it up and you would find something that would make you laugh or perhaps smile wryly or it would tug at your heartstrings um and it's collected by chapter so there's a little bit at every at the start of every chapter from Sophie explaining a little bit about the theme and how she came to write those particular strips um I hadn't read the comic strip before I must confess but I absolutely loved this. And what I loved most about it was something we touched on earlier that was that sense of queer community. So the group of friends all support one another and learn from each other. Um, the parents are all accepting. Um, it does deal with other people's transphobia and systemic injustice, um, but Hume is used very deftly to diffuse and undermine it. Um, so one way, for example, which it does this is by kind of uh, turning the tables. So, for example, when Sophie's friends ask her, what's it like going out with a straight cisgender boy? Isn't it weird? You're so brave. <laughs> um, and I think by sort of assuming that the reader will get the joke, it includes the reader in that sense of queer community. And that is really nice. Um, it's difficult to say what age range it is best suited to. Um, so Thieves is definitely older teens, I think, as you can, although there's there's nothing particularly explicit in in Thieves, but um some of some of the themes are definitely kind of teen. Um this one, on the other hand, I think is really it would work well for a huge range of ages. Um so I think adults would enjoy it, particularly if they grew up with the webcomic. Um, teens, it would work, it would be brilliant for teens, particularly young teens who are the same as the age as the characters in the book, and particularly those who are themselves trans or exploring their gender or gender identity. Um, and it would work well for younger kids as well. Um, there's nothing particularly adult in it at all. Um, there's a little bit of sort of sex education stuff at the end, but mainly at the level of consent is important, sort of that, that kind of thing. Um, and occasionally there's some sort of complex language around gender theory. But other than that, there is nothing particularly adult. This would be accessible and interesting to a wide a wide range of ages um so that's another really good one to get hold of right um so my final book is a non-victim book which is a very educational book so this will be really well suited for teachers or any people that work with um, children it's um, what does um, LGBT plus mean? It's a guide for young people and grown-ups because obviously there are lots of grown-ups out there where this terminology and this world is all new to them. And it's by Ollie Pike with Mel Lane and James Cannon. Ollie Pike has written many educational 
um, books and storybooks. And he's doing, he's a well-known presenter who decided that he needs to educate our young people and also grown-ups as well. And it just goes through a lot of the terminology connected with LGBT communities um, in a really bold cartoon style, very simple format. Um, it's very clear explanations because, um, you know, Mel Lane is a, you know, a teacher, so they work together to make sure that it's an accessible format. And it just really kind of set things out, answers any questions. There's classroom resources at the back if you require it as well. So we we're really lucky that actually the publisher popped into Upper Norwood Library on Saturday to gift this to us because they want to see it in their local Fantastic. library. Fantastic. Um, so thank you for that. And um, that will be on the shelves at Upper Norwood Library next week for you to borrow. But also, you know, it is a really good book, very clear and explains things very well. And I would recommend it if you're looking for something which is much more, it's not a story, it's explicit in teaching. It's there to teach, it's a teaching tool. And I've also got a non-fiction one, um, although mine is young adults, so it's for a slightly older age group than Zoe. So this one is Queerly Artistic, the ultimate guide for LGBTQIA plus teens on the spectrum. And this is by Erin Ekins, who is a queer artistic woman. Um, and this was long listed for the Polari Children's and Young Adults Book Prize. Um, there have been a few books come out recently um, that uh, are by and uh, not not by but for and about queer autistic teens and very often written by queer autistic adults as this one is. Um, so we previously reckon, recommended The Awesome Autistic Guide for Trans Teens by Yen Perkis and Sam Rose and A Different Sort of Normal by Abigail Balfe. Um, and it's really great to see all these books coming out because there is, as we've mentioned in previous chats, there is quite a big overlap in the Venn diagram between autistic people and queer people, particularly trans or gender non-conforming people. Um, and I think that this one has more of an emphasis on queerness than the previous two we have discussed. So it was nice to see it coming at it from that angle more. And also it was just great to have more books out there. Um, it's got chapters on topics such as coming out, transitioning, sex, relationships, and dealing with bullying, bigotry, and injustice. Um, so the, the author is cis, so um, she comments that she has made an effort to foreground trans voices and the work already done by trans people in the chapters on gender identity and trans transitioning, particularly. Um, I particularly liked that it is very clear, it's very practical, it's got lots of useful for suggestions for things you could do. So for example, how to come out or how to try out new pronouns. And it also has a lot of links at the end of every chapter to relevant support organizations. So this is a really good non-fiction book that deals with that intersection. Yeah, it's a very informative book. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot when I read it. So, Me too. Know. Yes. Yeah. So thanks for sharing all the books you've read. It always feels like we don't have enough books. And then every year it's like we've talked for over an hour about books. We clearly have a lot of books. <laughs> and there, there are, in fact, more. We could not fit everything in. So yeah. we've got the new, the new case and calendar. Um, Lark and Kasim Start a Revolution. We've got Ophelia After All by Raquel Marie. We've got She Drives Me Crazy by Qu Kelly Quinden. Uh, I Kissed Shara Wheeler by Casey McQuiston. Um, there's a new Adiba Jagada book out, mm -hmm. um, I which I haven't managed to get hold of yet, but I am very excited mm -hmm. about that because we both really loved her previous books. Yeah, and um, there's also quite a few picture books that we haven't had the chance to talk about um, by, you know, Harry Woodgate, um, 
let's do timid there's quite a few and hopefully we'll be able to talk about them more in maybe in the june book chat because obviously we're going to do another book chat for pride month but liz will definitely be putting them on the blog for you with information about this book so you can go out and get them sooner because they are out now there are some other books coming out later in the year so we'll be able to talk about them more in depth we've got um different for boys by patrick ness um, this is a illustrated version of a story he's told, which is coming out in March. And we've got two new UKYA books coming out as well, which is always good to see more UK um, authors writing. Uh, William Hussey has Broken Heart Zombie and Zombie Parts, which sounds like a very fun, a big gay rom com comedy, um, <laughs> which sounds so much fun. I can't wait to read this. Um, yeah, thanks, Osborne, for sending me a proof. This is going to be read very soon. And William Hussey's previous books were very serious topics, so it's going to be really fun to see um, how he writes comedies. And then we've got this one by Ephraim Nicole Wolf, um, Never Trust a Gemini. Um, as a Gemini, I'm intrigued as to why <laughs> one should not trust a Gemini. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to reading this one as well about some queer women too. Um, so yeah there's lots more exciting things to come and yes it's so, so we will see we will be back in june um so we hope you've enjoyed finding out about some new queer books thank you very much to everyone who has joined us and thank you zoe for all your contributions and your enthusiasm for queer literature as always <laughs> thanks so much liz and yes thank you for listening and i hope that you enjoy the books if you read them do get them from your local library or independent bookshop